Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. You've probably heard of a monkey puzzle tree. The monkey puzzle tree, it's a conifer. It grows to about 40 meters, which is about 130 feet, and it lives for hundreds of years. Yet, there's a bit of a problem, and that is because the monkey puzzle tree doesn't reach sexual maturity until it's 40 years old. Now, we're comparing the monkey puzzle tree with a little campion flower. And the campion flower looks puny. It's only a foot in height. And, you know, you look at this monkey puzzle tree soaring up there, this little puny campion flower, which one wins? This is where it gets all very interesting. While the monkey puzzle tree takes 40 years to reproduce, the campion flower reproduces within just four months. And what this means is that while the monkey puzzle tree goes through a single generation, the campion flower has gone through 120 generations. With every generation, there is a possibility of genetic mutation. That mutation may give the campion flower some superpower to help it survive and thrive. The speed of the life cycle means one very crucial thing. The species can adapt. It can adapt to rapid changes in the environment. There's a far greater chance of them getting better, hardier, different, possibly superior. Perfection, on the other hand, doesn't allow for speedy turnarounds. Many of us like the idea of perfection. We like to toil away at our work. We like to reach the seemingly impossible goal. And like the monkey puzzle tree, we put ourselves at a disadvantage that may seem hard to measure. And that's what we're going to cover in today's podcast. It's about how speedier revisions help us to overcome this insanity of perfection. We've been lucky. We've conducted courses like the article writing course online. We've been training our niece, Marsha, for several years. So we've seen speed work better when you're learning to cook, when you're learning to draw, when you're learning to do cartoons, write an article. And yet, this isn't a clarion call for shoddiness. In this series, we'll explore the importance of speed. Why is it better than perfection? And we'll also give a nod towards really outstanding work. But should we stick with speed at all times, or should we slow down at other times? Let's start out with how speedy progress reduces drain on energy. Marcia, my niece, was struggling in maths. She was in year four. She seemed to be at the bottom of the class. Four years later, she has won a distinction in maths for being among the top performers in the class. This year, five years later, teachers routinely call on her to evaluate and help the correction of tests. Plus, she often gets called to the board to demonstrate how to solve a maths problem. Now, you might have an inkling how Marsha was able to make this dramatic turnaround. Yes, there's hard work and there's good mentoring. In fact, on iXL alone, which is an app for maths learning, Marsha has solved over 18,000 problems. Staggering as that figure might seem, there are two ways to get anything done. The first is to be slow and methodical, and the second way is to beat the clock. In a psychotactics course, clients are trained to beat the clock. When you are conducting a live course at a venue, it's easy to monitor what's going on, what clients are doing, how they are taking the feedback, how they are handling the assignments. However, the moment you conduct a course online, it's impossible to tell how much time and how much effort is being put into a project. 
You don't get to see the drafts. You don't get to see the cancellations. You don't get to see the huge volume of edits that a client makes. All you ever get to see is finished work. However, on Psychotactics courses, we have a simple bunch of questions, and these need to be answered every single day. One of the questions is, how much time did you take to finish your assignment? In order to answer that question, it's important for the client to monitor their time. And then when they're submitting the assignment, they have to put it on the forum. So this bugged me a lot when a client wrote in and she told us how much time she had been spending on each article. Three hours. Three hours? Three hours for an article? I thought my instructions were pretty clear. I told the clients that they needed to do their article as quickly as possible, but I wasn't counting on the perfection monster. And it's not hard to imagine the state of that client. Let's call her candidate number one. Perhaps she started the assignment at 9 p.m., and it had already been an incredibly hard day. At midnight, that article is still not perfect, but she is too tired to argue with her drooping eyelids, so she hits publish, and the article is done. On the other hand, we have candidate number two, and this candidate rigidly follows the instructions and stops typing the moment the clock strikes 90 minutes, which is what we recommend. So whose article will be superior? The article of candidate number one or candidate number two? The answer is, they're both not very good. When you are just starting to learn to draw, to write, to dance, to draw cartoons, you know approximately where your ultimate goal lies. As broadcaster Ira Glass says, you have style. You know what the finished product looks like. But there is this gap. There is this gap between what you would like to see, what you would like to be, and what you can produce right now. Hence, both of the articles, both candidate number one and candidate number two, are good early versions, but they're nowhere close to amazing. Yet one person has taken three hours while the other has stopped diligently at 90 minutes. Who's going to be more tired? Who's going to make more mistakes as the fatigue sets in? Who's going to be struggling both at work and to complete the assignment the next day? And what about the day after next and the day that follows it? The campion flower comes to mind, doesn't it? It's all very fine to aspire to be a monkey puzzle tree. It's all fine to soar at a hundred feet or more. However, the campion flower concept is what we all need, and we need it to get to our finish line, which is exactly what Renuka, my wife Renuka, what she did with Marsha's maths tuition. Now, as you already know, four or five years ago, Marsha's situation was pretty bad. So we should have gone and said, okay, let's do this perfectly. Let's get it right. Instead, Renuka would give Marsha an assignment and she'd use a timer. Invariably, the mistakes would soar at the start, but all the mistakes were being made in a precise amount of time. And it gave Marsha a chance to recover. The brain learns a lot when it's doing the task, but the downtime is just as important, if not more important. And this helps in the learning in the implementation process. Whether it's cooking a meal or completing a project, we all should be campion flowers. That goal is important because it allows you to make a huge number of mistakes. What we call skill or talent is a reduction of errors. So you need to make the errors and then you need to reduce them or you need to eliminate them completely. If you take your time over a project, you can only make a fixed number of errors. Which is why in a course or in a workshop, I encourage clients to do their assignments quickly. It's quick rather than perfect. Which means that if a client were to do their assignment early in the morning, they could get a correction, possibly many corrections, within an hour or so. By lunchtime, they could have another bunch of corrections. By tea time, another bunch of corrections. So what we have is a whole bunch of corrections, three, four, five drafts, and with every submission, they have fewer errors to fix. However, only the first submission would be lengthy. The submissions through the day would be shorter and we'd be tweaking nuances. So 
it doesn't take too much energy, it doesn't take too much focus. Now compare this with the monkey puzzle client, the client who waits all day, mulls and toils over his work. When he finally submits it late at night, he misses out on all those nuances, all of those corrections during the day, all of those tiny little bits. And it's not like no progress is being made, but from an evolutionary point of view, he's hardly budged at all. Ironically, it's the speed that has created more errors and more genetic modifications, and that has helped the person improve their skill at a much faster rate. If you're trying to be perfect, your monkey puzzle submission is the worst possible way to go about it. In fact, this is a good point to just stop and talk about energy. Energy is the most crucial part of any project. When you create versions or you create tiny bits, you have a fixed deadline and then you say, okay, I'm done with this version and we'll move on or we'll fix it in the next version. It seems like a pretty idiotic way to go about your work. However, the main point of this article is that your work will not improve dramatically. It will not improve dramatically when you're just starting out. If you put in 200% more time or 300% more time, it's not that your work improves by 200% or 300%. In most cases, it budges by just 5% or 7%. And of course, I'm just throwing up these figures. But what I've seen in so many disciplines, like article writing, copywriting, cartooning, we teach so many things. And you see that people don't budge that much when they put in twice the amount of time. On the other hand, if they create versions that, okay, I've finished with this article, I'll just fix it and make it version 1.1 of this article or 1.2. What we have is this whole version tracking campion flower kind of thing. And every modification takes less and less energy, but they've learned so much and the skill has advanced so much just doing those versions. And this is true even when we are struggling to learn or implement something. Let's say you're recording a YouTube video or you're creating a screencast. Not one of us is surprised to find that the third or the fourth version is superior. Photographers, even experienced photographers, routinely find that if they take many pictures of the same object, they'll be composing better in the second, third, fourth, fifteenth time. But there has to be a limit because you can keep taking pictures, you can keep writing, you can keep doing stuff endlessly. Even in the movies, they do many takes, not because they have too much money or too much time to blow, but because the versions improve with every take. Instead of trying to labor onwards with your first version, it's almost better to move on to the second, to the third, and then to have this deadline. The problem is that we often look at projects as a whole. For instance, you see yourself as writing one article, doing one podcast, writing one book. However, the bigger picture is far more important. What if you had to write an article a day or a book a month? What would you do differently? The changes that you'd make would all be energy dependent. You'd work in short, intense bursts. You'd improve as you went along. And you'd proceed to create a greater volume of work and far, far superior work than your peers. And this brings us to the third part, which is doesn't painstaking work count? Yes, it does. You want to do outstanding work. You want to take loads of time to do it. However, just working as a perfectionist means you're going to manage a single version of your work. So if two people, person A and person B, were to start the same assignment on the same day, the person that lavished more attention to their work would have a much better result, or at least it would seem so. Now that would only be the initial advantage, because that advantage wouldn't stay in place for long. Within a few weeks, person B would be far ahead of person A. And that is because person B is making many revisions. So all of these little tweaks are coming in place. All of the speed is coming in place. So person A looks much better to begin with, but somewhere down the line, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks later, person B is far ahead.
What you consider to be imperfect is often your own perception. Nobody is saying that you should do shoddy work. You should do great work. But you have to have a deadline. You can come back later in the day and then make little tweaks and that's okay. Make versions of your stuff. But everything needs to work to a deadline. Otherwise you end up like that client who spent three hours every time and her work wasn't improving as dramatically as it could. And the moment she stopped doing that, she stopped being the perfectionist, she started making big leaps, big changes in her writing. So how do you benchmark your work? How do you say, okay, this is enough? Usually the way I go about it is my own perception, but also how the client perceives my work. So if the client or the person receiving your work is happy with your work, then there is not much of a reason to be a perfectionist. If you truly want to do outstanding work, you have to be person B most of the time. Occasionally, you can be person A. You can be a perfectionist, that's okay. Some of the time, it's just fine. But in the long run, the greater the output, the better the work. And that is because you're constantly getting feedback. Marsha moved at a very high speed, but the program, that's IXL, it always gave her feedback. Renuka was always working with her, always giving her feedback, why she got stuff wrong, how to fix it. And the students on a course, on any of our courses, they move very quickly and they get feedback. This allows them to make big changes. The painstaking work is great when you have the luxury of time. But none of us have that time. That was when we were in university and we had loads of time to do absolutely nothing. But now we have deadlines. And at the same time, we have to improve our work. It's the same time we have to get to perfection. So we do this. We keep making versions. One more point and then we're done. Take this very podcast, for instance. I usually do one podcast a day. And today, I did three of them. But I had fixed deadlines, and that's because we are headed to Brussels, we're headed to Singapore, to Italy, and I don't have that luxury of time. So I've got to finish all of these podcasts before we leave. And doesn't make the podcast worse, does it? It still is a great podcast. It still has all the right structure, the right music. It has everything in place. And maybe it could have been 10% better or 15% better, but would you notice? would I notice? And that's the whole point, because over the past four years, we have been putting out the podcast, and you can go back to episode one or episode two and episode 25 or episode 50, and what you'll notice is the marked difference between the sound, the structure. I, in fact, was told by Renuka to go back and do one of the earlier podcasts, and I couldn't go through it. I couldn't go through the structure. Now, you wouldn't have known the difference, but it was such a big struggle for me. And the reason why I can put out podcasts at this frequency and articles at this rapid pace is because of the versions. Every week, a new podcast has to come out every week. I said podcast, but well, this is about perfection, so we won't go and edit it. Anyway, every week, this podcast has to come out and I have to write the article. And so you get better and better and better. And every podcast is a version. And you can find out for yourself by going and listening to all 180 or 190, I don't know how many there are at this point in time, but all of them, and you will find that progression. Just one more point of clarification. As I said, this is not to suggest that you have to put in shoddy work. Even as I'm recording this podcast, there are some mistakes, lots of mistakes, And a podcast of 20 minutes, it takes about one hour at least to read out. And I will go back and forth, back and forth, editing it. And that editing has its limit. So right now it's about 5.20 p.m. when I'm recording the third podcast for the day. And I know that no matter what, I have to stop by 6 o'clock. So the creation and the edit process needs to be within that 6 o'clock deadline. And that's how I record. I kind of make a mistake and then I edit it and then continue and then edit it. But that's because anything else would just be distracting. And if there is something distracting, you have to take it out. But other than that, your perfection, that's just your perception. 
And with that, let's end this podcast. So what did we cover so far? What we covered was this concept of the monkey puzzle tree. And the monkey puzzle tree takes too much time to get to perfection, to get to sexual maturity. And the campion flower, on the other hand, is quick. It reproduces 120 times in that same 40-year span. So what we are looking at is what you can do in a short period. The second thing is understanding energy, because energy is what creates skill and talent. What you've got to do is create versions. So the first version of your article, your first version of your cartoon, the first version of your video, that's going to take an enormous amount of time. And then you're going to get feedback from somebody and you can tweak that and it won't take so much time. And then you come back again and you tweak that. And sometimes in the duration or the course of the day, you can tweak it many times, make it far superior and you don't spend as much energy. So instead of three hours or six hours on a project, you spend two hours first and then after that all the tweaks are much shorter, much smaller. Finally, no one is asking you to put in shoddy work. The client is going to like your work at a certain level and that's when you have to give up. You're going to have to publish your article at a certain point and you're your own client and you're going to have to give up. And it's not shoddy, it is not as good as it could be, but that's fine. You have the next version and next version and you keep writing, keep drawing, keep doing stuff over and over again. And you notice that progress happens. I mean, I started drawing on my moleskin books. I started drawing in 2010. Right now I finished 2000 of them. I've not really gone for any class. I've got some videos, I've learned some courses and stuff. But I've not gone for any class. And yet, when I look at my books, just the versions of the illustrations, and my work has improved tenfold, twentyfold, I don't know. It's, it's dramatically different. And this is what you call versions, and this is how you improve all the time. I run into people all the time who call themselves perfectionists. They tell themselves, somebody else says, you know, you're a perfectionist. And I know that most of these people are trying to shake the habit. It's easy to see why they are trying to stay perfectionist. And that's a comfort zone. Well, here's what psychologists suggest. If you want to break out of your comfort zone, you have to stretch yourself ever so slightly. If you're laboring over a single article for several hours, how about spending half the time getting to the same goal? Your work might not be as perfect as you hoped, but it gives you a chance to get that feedback, to improve, and to put out that article. If you're struggling to do one cartoon, how about doing two cartoons today in the same amount of time, getting feedback and then drawing even more? It's easy for me to suggest that you need to take a big leap, but that massive jump might not be possible. Instead, you need to take a smaller one, just a slight stretch goal. Set yourself the time in which you'll be able to complete the job. Stop. Get feedback. Then tomorrow do the same thing. And if you follow this simple formula, you'll find yourself less exhausted. You'll find that you have more energy. However, the biggest benefit of all is that you become far better and far quicker at what you're doing. And that is what you wanted anyway, didn't you? You wanted perfection and this is the way forward. And this brings us to the one thing that you can do today. What can you do today? Go online, go to Google, type in monkey puzzle tree. Then print it out and stick it in a prominent place where you can see it just in case you forget. And don't look for the perfect picture. Any monkey puzzle tree will do. That's me, Sean. This is the saying bye for now. We'll head into psychotactics and see what's happening in psychotactics land, shall we? So what's happening in Psychotactics land? Well, as you know, we're headed to Brussels and Singapore and Italy for a month-long holiday. And as you also know, this is the three-month vacation, which means that we take one month at a time because we need to recharge and we need to come back with all that energy so we can do better podcasts, better courses, better everything else. 
Now what are you going to do while we're gone? You can head to the Psychotactics site and look up Chaos Planning. So that's psychotactics.com slash chaos. And the reason for this is if you're not planning with chaos on your side, then inevitably you're going to have stress during the day. If you notice at Psychotactics, we're doing more stuff. We're doing more stuff on Instagram. We're doing stuff in terms of articles, more podcasts, so much more stuff. And we don't have a team. We're not hiring more people. We're not doing any of the things that you hear on online, which is, okay, you have to do this and this and this and this and this. And this. No, we're not doing any of that. Yet, you see that a lot more stuff comes out of Psychotactics, which is even better than ever before. And the reason for that is we understand how chaos works. So go to psychotactics.com slash chaos, and that's where you will find a kind of solution for reducing the stress in your day. If you've already read Chaos Planning, then you might want to go to fix up your website. And there are three critical pages on your website. So if you go to website components, you can fix those pages. That's at psychotactics.com slash web. Pretty easy to remember. And finally, 5000 BC. 5000 BC is a place for introverts. It's a really great place. And yes, we'll be away for a few weeks. And we will be back. But while we're gone, there are the cave elves. And they come in, they pitch in, they help. And you will find this welcoming committee for you. People who are extremely friendly, extremely helpful. Because that's the motto. Be kind, be helpful, or be gone. So join us in 5000 BC. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review on wherever you're listening to the podcast. So go to iTunes and leave a review. Because it helps other people listen to it and find us. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now, and we'll see you in 5000 BC. Bye-bye. Still listening? While I was writing the script for this podcast, writing down the ideas, Renuka was working on her cartoons, and she hasn't been drawing cartoons on a consistent basis for quite a while. So she sat there, and then she was fiddling with this arm and getting really upset with herself, and I said to her, look, how about taking the advice that we give others, which is that we have a deadline and you do many versions of the same cartoon. So that's what I got her to do. I gave her a deadline. I literally turned on the stopwatch and I said, your time starts now, five minutes. And that's how we went about it. And she finished and she put it on her Instagram account at Renuka Madness. And you can see all of the mad cartoons there as well. So that's it. We're going to be in Europe by the time this podcast comes out. We'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, and in case you're wondering, it's now 5.35. So I just have to remove the noise in this podcast and do some little fiddling around. And then it's the music. So that's finally bye-bye.